right? So let's see that where it is utilized. The first instance would be that there are certain algorithms which are probabilistic in nature, probabilistic in nature, right? So one thing which is you may have heard is naive Bayes, right? So these are, this is a classification and it can be a regression also, naive Bayes algorithm, which is completely based on conditional probability and Bayes theorem, right? So once we have to understand that algorithm, you need to have certain basis in probability to understand that algorithm. That's one thing. Uh, couple of like many places, uh, but even before that, let's see that why probability even exists for machine learning. The reason, the, the very fundamental reason that why probability is needed for machine learning is what is the probability? Probability is like when we are quantifying uncertainty, right? In some way, right? That we are not completely sure that what is the probability of this happening? It may happen, it not may not happen. We are quantifying that. And as you know, machine learning or data science is nothing but statistics, right? Our machine learning, classical machine learning is entirely based on statistical principles, right? And what is a statistics? A statistic in this particular framework, what we are doing is we have a, we call something which is population, right? And we have something which is called sample. We are trying to decipher, we are trying to estimate something related to population from the sample. Let me give you an example. So let's say you have a square footage and you have price for the for apartments or condos or houses, right? Like, is it possible, humanly possible to get all the samples in the entire city before you start predicting? No, you will not be able to get the each and every household price, right? You will not be able to get. What you will get, you probably would get 1,000 house prices or 10,000 house prices in the city. And you will estimate what you are going to estimate. You are estimating for a new unseen house, which is what's not there in your sample, which are not there as a part of your survey. You are trying to estimate the price of that. What you are doing, what you are doing from sample, you are trying to predict something for the population, right? If population is this big, sample is probably somewhere over here. And with this particular smaller information, you're trying to predict for, you're trying to generalize it for the population. That's what a statistics is, right? Inferential statistics is this thing at a 10,000 feet level. That's all we are trying to do. And in machine learning, similarly, we are trying to estimate about the population from the sample, from the data set which we have. That's what we are trying to do, right? When we are trying, when we are trying to estimate this based on this sample about this population, can we be hundred percent sure that what will be uh, like our estimate will be hundred percent accurate? No, we cannot be right because all we are seeing is a very small subset of data. We are, we we there is no way we can know the total true distribution of the population, right? How it exists in the world. We do not know. We are trying to estimate. When we do not know, there will always be a small chance of uncertainty, right? A small chance of that maybe we are not 100% right over there, right? Maybe there is a small error margin. All the error margin is where the probability fits into a statistics, right? And this is the whole game, right? Because all we are trying to do is probabilistically defining that what is the likelihood, what is the chance of something happening, right? Okay, so if I say, let's say uh, a very simplistic case that I have been given the sample and I'm sample, obviously I can calculate the sample mean, right? For this a small sample, I can calculate the sample mean. Let's say 10. Can I say that this 10 is the population mean also, like for the entire population, that is also the average? No, we cannot say that. But with certain statistical tools or using some techniques, we can say that, okay, it may not be 10, but I'm 90% confident that it will be between 10 plus minus three, right? With 90% confidence, I can say that it will be 10 plus minus three, right? Either it is between seven and 13. I'm very certain about that, right? And that's that technique, what we are leveraging is a statistical inferential techniques, right? And because there is a chance of 
not getting it 100% right, there is a bandwidth, there is an uncertainty. That's where the probability fits in. Okay. So coming back to the original question that probability in a more common sense, it is used in certain algorithms. Now you, you see all the chat GPT or large language model, you may have heard, right? At the end, these LLMs, what they're doing, you are passing a token. Okay. So let's see this particular thing is not visible to you, right? And this is your prompt, which you are sending to chat GPT, okay? Or any LLM model for GPT or any LLM model. At a very, very naive fundamental level, what it is doing is it is trying to see these all are called tokens. It is trying to see all these tokens. And then from his vocabulary, from the chat GPT's vocabulary, which it has constructed, which may have 50,000 word 100,000 or 500,000 words of English. Of all the words which are present in English, including a, the, man, woman, everything, it will try to predict the probability that what is the, sorry, what is the probability of A happening as the next word, D happening as the next word, man happening as the next word, this word, this word, and everything it will try to write for A happening is 0.001. 0 0.05 is this probability, 0 0.3 is the, and then it is, all it is doing, it is trying to calculate that what is the max value, which is the max over here, right? So the max came that one word would be probability, probably probability would be 0 0.1, and 0 0.1 is the maximum probability I'm getting. That's why with a high likelihood, I can say that I'm predicting next word as probability. And all element is doing is doing next prediction. Now this will become my prompt. This will become my context. And it starts printing or it starts generating the next token and next token and next token. So the reason I'm saying this probability is important because even if you're learning generative AI or large language model or things like that, beneath the scene, beneath the hood, all it is working is base theorem, right? So it makes a little bit of sense to have little time, give it like 30 minutes, one hour and understand what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, any question? Or does that make sense that why we are, why we are doing this whole exercise? Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So yesterday we were dealing with this very simple example, fair, fair coin tossing half of the chance of had half of the chance of tail. If suppose we have, we want to get like probability of two heads, right? Head, head. Then we were saying that half into half one by four. And the other way of looking that was the sample space, right? So H, H could happen. T, T could happen. H, T could happen. And T, H could happen. Where T and H are head and tail. They are autumn, like in my sample space. These are the four events which can happen, right? What I'm doing is I'm interested only in two head, which is one out of four. And that's why my probability is one by four, right? This is another way of looking at it, okay? Let's move on. Um, see this example, okay? A pair of dice, two dices are rolled and dices are one to six, normal dices. So what is the, the question is that, what is the probability that the sum of both the numbers on the die comes to four? What is the probability of that? These are the, the, this will be my sample space, like first dice, second dice, first dice, second dice, first dice, second dice, right? All the combination, 36 combinations would be there, right? What is the chance that my sum of both the numbers on the dice becomes four? Anybody? Adds to four. What, what, are, the, what are the places where it will become four? You want one by two. Three, one, two, two, one, three. Is there any place else which will become four? No, no. No, right. How many total events were there? 36. 36. How many events are in favorable side, right? Like which will give you four? Three. One by 12, right? That's the probability of getting a four, right? This is how we calculate, right? Out of total sample or total number of events which can happen, what is the favorable event, right? Let's take another example, okay? What is the probability of getting no heads when a fair coin is tossed three times? I am not getting any head. 
when the fair coin is cost three times. What is my sample? This is my sample, HHH, HHT, HTH, and blah, blah, blah. I should not get any head, no heads. How many total sample? What? That's one by eight. One by eight, right? Because only this thing will have no head, right? The rest all have heads, right? So one by eight, clear? Okay, basic rules of probability. Probability will always be between zero and one, right? Because it's a fraction, right? So it, it can touch one, it cannot go beyond one, okay? And if we are talking about the entire sample space, right? Like, okay, what is the probability that I roll a dice and the number comes between one and six? Obviously it, it's one, right? Because we are counting the entire sample space. So PS will be one. Okay, for any event, this has to be true, right? The complement of P is P, not P, right? Not E. Let's say E is an event. E could be termed as, let's say, I'm getting one in a dice roll, right? I'm getting number one in a dice roll. So the probability of this will be what? One by six, not getting one. What is the probability of that? Five by six, right? I can get two, three, four, five, six out of total six events, right? So five by six, not getting is five by six. The complement of these two will always be equal to one. That's another, right? The complement rule of probability, which is very intuitive, right? Which makes sense. Something happening, something not happening has to add up to one, right? It will rain, the chance is 0.2. It will not rain, the chance has to be 0.8, right? Because there has to be some equal to one. Okay, uh, let's see the addition rules, right? Uh, now, now there is a concept of disjoint. What are disjoint and what are dependents, right? Uh, but let's uh, first say graphically what is disjoint events, right? Yesterday also we were talking about that, right? P A and P B. In case of when, if these are not overlapping, they are called disjoint. If they have an overlap, they are called joint, right? The probability of this, and we'll just see that in a minute that why it is this. This you can read at as P A union B or A or B. That means either A or B happening. In this particular case, if A or B happening, what we are trying to estimate? We are trying to estimate this particular area, right? Correct? A or B, which has to be equal to P A, this area, which has to be equal to P B, this area. And this particular shape, intersection area, common area is being counted twice, right? Both with yellow and red. So we have to count only once, right? To get the overall area, right? We can see that with an example, but in case of jointed, intuitively this makes sense, right? Graphically it makes sense. And in case of disjointed, because there is nothing in common, then P, A and B becomes zero anyway, right? There is nothing, no overlap, nothing in common. So this has to be true, right? Okay. Uh, this is the complement of that thing, which is fine. What is this joint event? I was saying that this joint event P A B is equal to zero. Let's take it with an example, right? What we mean by mutually exclusive or disjoint event. So when you are rolling a six sided die, the event that rolling an even number and rolling an odd number, even numbers in a six sided die is two, four, six. Odd numbers are one, three, five. What is the chance that I will get a even number also and an odd number also at the same time. Will it be like this, even and odd? Or will the graph will be the, like this, even and odd, even and odd, right? Will it be joint or is this joint? This joint. Yeah. This joint, right? Because two, four, six and one, three, five doesn't have anything in common, right? So these are mutually exclusive. That if one happens, other doesn't happen, right? What are dependent events, right? So like these are the terms which we'll keep hearing in literature and books also. So it makes sense to understand that. Dependent is where, and the whole idea of conditional probability is based on dependent events. So dependent says that if one event has occurred, that has changed the probability for the other event. Okay, let's take it with an example, okay? Um, if you know the playing cards, right? The deck of playing cards, Okay, how many cards it has? 52. Okay. Um, how many how many hearts are there? 
how many heart related cards are there right red heart color card how many of there be 13 13 right if i say that what is the probability of um i took a card initially right and that card was heart okay i took a card and that card was heart i didn't replace it i didn't put it back what is the probability that the next card which i am trying to get is also a heart right what is the probability that the next time i am trying to get is also a heart right what will be the probability of that yeah 31 51 how many cards are left 51. now 51 how many yeah. total number of hearts which are left over there mm, 12. 12 12 right so it, it will not be 1 by 4 unless we replace it will not be 1 by 4 or 13 by 52 the probability has changed because of the prior event right and it had changed to this 12 by 51 that is called dependent event if one event had changed the probability for the next event right so officially it is defined as dependent events are events where the outcome of one event affects the probability of the other events right we'll see that in case of con conditional probability okay uh this is a union b right a or b we know that this is a and b a intersection b in case of venn diagram this is not a right not a is what anything but a so 1 minus p a right this is 1 minus p a over here a and not b what does it mean that it has to be a but not b so obviously this particular green area will come right this is just to show intuitively to you that okay in case we we'll, we are, we are talking about two non mutually exclusive events then how should we how should we mentally think about it conditional probability conditional probability of event b occurring given that event a has already occurred this is how you should read that and this is what we are talking about yesterday all we'll read is conditional probability based theorem and we'll keep a pause because till that point only the probability is being used in case of machine learning okay the way to read this is that a has already happened given a what is the chance of b happening this is the way that means a has already occurred now what is the chance of b happening okay and the way they say this formula is that p b given a is p a and b which is p a intersection b this this is the same thing they are the same thing divided by p a now let's see in case of our diagram that whether it makes sense or not intuitively it makes sense or not p b given a given a has happened given a has happened what is the chance that b is happening what will be that area this only right what is this area p a intersection b and what is the total like total in the sense that out of all events this was my favorable event right what is the all event given that a has happened what is area for that this whole area now let's see does it make sense or not right this divided by this will be this thing or not right in our head is that is that concept clear that given a has happened what is the chance that b will happen given a has happened i'm restricting my space to this right to 51 cards now right i'm restricting it now now what is the chance that a heart will also come over there okay P A intersection B. Makes sense? Any confusion in this conditional probability that why it makes sense? Yeah, and a quick question, quick question here. Um, does this concept has anything to do or is this link with the correlation uh, between correlation between? Between two 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 numbers. Not that I know of. I may be, I, I, I may have missed something, but no, the correlation, no, no. Okay. yeah, correlation is necessarily, all correlation is saying that if A is moving in upward, B is also moving upward, or A is moving upward, B is going, like there has to be a relationship in their movement, right? And that quantification of that relationship is correlation. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say if this is my A, this is my B, mm -hmm. if the data is spread like that, I can say that they are positively correlated. Why? A is going up, B is going up, right? If my data is spread like this, like this, right? I will say it is negatively correlated because they are moving in opposite direction. A is going up, A is going up, B is going down. B is moving in this direction, right? So B is going down. That's what, and, and how you quantify this relationship, right? It's called correlation. Mm. Yeah, I'm mixing some concepts. And correlation will always between, Pearson correlation will always be between minus one and one, right? Mm -hmm. Probability on the other hand, stands between zero and one in that respect. Minus one is perfectly negatively correlated. Plus one is perfectly positively correlated. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah, this is the example which we are seeing yesterday. Okay. Um, e is, uh, this is the dice, right? E is all the even numbers. Even numbers are what? In a dice, four, two, six, odd numbers are what? Sorry, prime numbers are what? Five, three, and two. And one is neither prime nor or we have kept it outside, okay? Let's try to see the probability of, let's, let me put P E given P, right? And as per our conditional probability formula, if you see, it should be what? It should be P E intersection P by P, the denominator oh. has to be the second one, right? So P P. This should be the formula. Let's say that it makes intuitive sense with an example or not. What is, let's try to calculate the left-hand side separately. P, given it is prime number, what is the probability that it is an even number? Given that it is prime number, what is the probability that it is an even number? One sixth. No, one by three. Huh? One, one by three. three. Yeah. One by three. Okay. Why? Because given that it is a prime number, right? Given that it is a prime number, what is the probability that is in an even number also, right? Okay. And let's let's try to see this one. What is given that it is a what is the intersection of probability of intersection of E and P, right? The number is both a prime and an even number. What is the probability of that happening? Both a prime Plus and an even number. One by six. six. One by six. No, but... What is the probability of one some number six. happening prime? Three I roll by... a dice and it became prime. Yeah. Three by six. Three by six. Three by six, right? If you solve them, it will be one by three, right? Correct? So yeah. my left hand side yeah. and right hand side independently, right, in both the ways, it matches. So like giving with an example also, this makes sense. This conditional probability does make sense, right? It has some basis. Okay. So this is the same thing which I'm talking about, right? Over here. And again, you can in your in mentally you can visualize that P A intersection B, this particular gray uh, yellow area divided by P B. P B is the whole area makes logical sense of P A given B, right? A has already happened. B has already happened. What is the chance of A happening? Obviously, this is the only chance which A has, right? Of this thing. The way to interpret this is big B numerator, this thing, right? Which is exactly represented over here, okay? Now we are taking this to a one more mathematical jugglery. That's all we are doing from conditional probability to Bayes theorem. What we are doing? This thing we already know is a true, okay? The other way to write this would be this also, right? The corollary of that. P A given B, P A intersection B by P B, P B given A, it should be P B A, right? P B A. Now think about it. P B intersection A and P A intersection B, uh, can they be different? When they are overlapping or non-overlapping, whatever, can they be different? No, they has to be the same, right? No. They cannot be yeah. different. Correct. Yeah. So what we are writing, P A intersection B over here. What we did, we moved this to the left-hand side. 
over there and we equated. So the first, this equation became P A given B into P B, right? Correct. P A yes. intersection B is equal to this. Here P A intersection B becomes P B given A into P A, right? Correct. We equated yes. these two things. And we are deriving P A given B. We are bringing this particular guy denominator over here, right? And we arrived at this formula. And this, my friend, is called Bayes theorem. Why Bayes theorem is such a big deal, right? Now, the next question is that why it is such a big deal? Naive base is based on Bayes theorem with a small twist. We'll learn about that when we reach naive base, right? But why it is useful? It is useful because if you know these probabilities, right? Sometimes it is easier to calculate this probability, this probability and this probability from historical data and all. But there is no easy way to calculate this. And if you know these things, Mr. Bates says that you should be able to figure this out. And that's what the big deal is all about. Okay. Let's try to see that with an example and perhaps it will become clear. I took it from internet, but let's see if it, if it hits you and makes sense to you. Okay. You're planning a picnic today, but the morning is cloudy. Oh no, 50% of the rainy days start off cloudy. 50% of all rainy days start off as cloudy. Okay, but cloudy mornings are common. About 40% of the day starts cloudy. So 40% of all day is cloudy anyway. And this is usually a dry month. When we are planning, it is usually a dry month, right? So there is only a chance of rain is what? 10%. This we can get from the, let's say, historical weather app or some, some forecasting techniques, right? That historically in the month of September, it is only rainy 10% of the time, okay? These data we have written. So we'll use rain to me. Now to calculate, given that it is cloud in the morning, what is the chance that it will rain? Because we are arranging a picnic. So it makes sense to understand that what is the chance that today it will rain, given that it is cloudy, okay? For that, what will go? P cloud. We're seeing that P cloud also 40% of the day starts cloudy, right? So we have this information of 0 0.4 over here, right? This information we have from the weather app or whatever, we have that information. Let's say that whether we have the information for P rain also. P rain also we have that in the month of September, usually 10% of the time it is rainy. So 0 0.1 over there also we fit. P cloud given rain, given that it was rainy, was it cloudy or not, right? This is the question that all 50% of all rainy days start off as cloudy. So this becomes 0 0.5. Now with this data set, it is, it is simple to calculate that if the day starts with cloud, whether it will rain or not, right? What will be the value? The value will be like 0 0.5 by four, which is, I multiplied by 25 up and down, and this becomes 100. The numerator becomes 125, 12.5, right? So 12.5% chance, given these data sets, today, given that it was cloudy in the morning, it will rain, is only 12.5% chance, right? Given these data sets. So this is a naive example, but this is, this is essentially what Ni uh, sorry, base theorem is used for, right? Because sometimes it is difficult to directly get this probability, but it's easier from historical data to get these probabilities, right? Make sense? Absolutely. Now I get it. Now you get that. Okay. Glad. Are you ready for one more, which is very counterintuitive? At least to me, it appeared very counterintuitive. One last example, and we'll call it like probability is done. Like this is all you need to know. If you understood till here, this is all you need to know for your machine learning. Shall we do one more example? This is where yes. we left yesterday. Yes. yes, please. Okay. So here is the question. <clears throat> a patient visits a doctor with a COVID test report. Okay. The report it says it is positive. The patient has COVID, right? Does it mean that the patient really has COVID? The test also has certain, we call it sensitivity and specificity, right? For the true positive and true negative in medical terms. But it has some accuracy level, right? In layman's term, it has some accuracy, right? 
So the report says positive. This is what the doctor knows. The doctor knows that in his community, the likelihood of a patient getting COVID is 1%. Out of every 100, one will be positive. This is what your uh, the data when the COVID was there, the government usually used to do random tests, right? So that they can predict that what is the prevalence going on this, right? And there are certain other measures which they were taking based on that. But to do these random checks at airports and all, this was one of the reasons. They wanted to figure out the prevalence, okay? The second data which is known, given to known COVID patients, the test, let's say it is RT-PCR test or something, okay? Given to known COVID patient, the test has 80% success rate. What does it mean? That if it has tested 100 COVID positive patients, only 80% of the time it is saying that the patient has COVID. 20% of the time it fails to predict, okay? So 80% of the time for really positive cases, the true positive, its true positive rate is only 80%, right? 20% of the time it will say negative even for the positive cases. Given to no non-COVID patients, it has a false negative also, false positive also, right? Sorry, false positive also. Given to non-COVID people, if the patient doesn't have COVID, it returns 10% of false positive. So if it tests 10 people who doesn't have COVID, one person will come out as test positive. Now the question really is whether this particular patient who has come to the doctor's clinic has COVID or not. And what is the not has COVID or not? What is the chance that that person has COVID? Okay, with these data sets. Let's apply Bayes theorem over here. What is the Bayes theorem say? We have to see, given that the person is tested positive, whether the person has COVID or not, right? This is what we are trying to evaluate. And to put that into Bayes theorem, what is the, the denominator has to be the P tested positive. The numerator has to be P has COVID and the, we multiplied with the probability, conditional probability of has COVID, given that the patient has COVID, what is the chance that the he's tested positive? Do we have all these data or not? Let's see. Okay. Um, we'll take a sample of 1,000 people, okay? Just to just to see this with the, with the numbers, right? Out of 1,000 people, we are saying that the Population has 1% prevalence, right? What does it mean? Out of 1,000 people, 10 people has COVID and 990 people will not have COVID, right? When these 10 people who has COVID, because the prevalence rate is 1%, when these pe people have COVID, what is the result? My test is 80% correct, right? So eight people will be categorized as positive, two people will be categorized as non-positive, right? Negative. Out of these 990, if I test it, my test has a false positive rate of 10%, right? So 99 people will be categorized out of those people who didn't have COVID. 99 will be categorized as having positive. 891 will be categorized as negative, right? Any, any confusion in this, right? That why we are doing this or does it make sense or not, right? With those data sets which we have. Let's say the probability of tested positive. What is the probability of the people who have tested pro positive? How many positive cases are there? This is positive case. This is also positive case, right? How many total positive? 107. 107 out of what? 1,000 people, right? This is my denominator. Clear? What is my numerator? P has COVID. How many people have COVID? 10 out of 1,000 people, right? This is P has COVID. Prevalence rate 1%. Now, this particular data set, do we have this information or not? Given the people ha person has COVID, he has tested positive. Given the person has COVID, he is tested positive. What is that? Eight. Eight by ten, right? Right. Anybody can any confusion in that? No, right? Okay. I cancel this out, cancel this out, and this became eight by one hundred seven. Eight by one hundred seven translates to seven point four percent. 
That's it. If a person is tested positive with COVID, with that test, with a with a false positive rate as this and true positive rate as that, with that data set, all we can say, all the doctor can say is that only 7.4% statistically that person has COVID, right? The chance of person have COVID. 7.4% is nothing. It's, it's less than 10%, right? So that's the reason that why doctors also evaluate symptoms, right? The symptoms which patient has and they do not go blindly with the COVID test, right? Okay. So what tilted this? Like what tilted this unintuitive, counterintuitive result? Prevalence. It's a rare disease, right? Out of 100, only one person comes with that disease, rare disease cases. So this is known as rare disease cases. Even when the tests were relatively fine, 80% and 10% false positive rate and 80% true positive rate and all, even then we got only 7.4%. With 7.4%, does it even make sense to go for that sort of test, right? If the disease is so rare? No. Like, um, like why would you do that, right? So this was one of the counterintuitive examples which I saw and which I thought that I should share with you all. Okay. Okay. This brings us to the end of probability. Um, I hope you got, and th this is, this is all you need to know. If you have assimilated till now, well and good. Uh, question. And one question, one question here. Um, does deep learning follow the same principles? Deep learning follows the same principles. So probability, yeah. As machine learning. Yeah, yeah. So you again going back to the LM examples, right? LLM is nothing but deep learning, right? It is deep learning. It's a very large neural network which is trained, right? The output of deep learning after this point in time has been the output, what it is giving is not a not a fixed dog versus cat type of classification, but instead it is outputting in my general vocabulary, the probability of all these words, which is there in my vocabulary, it is predicting that. That's what it is trained for, right? So the output of this neural network is probably the, the vocabulary is 50,000, then the output is 50,000 classes, which is coming out, right? 50,000 classes and all these classes, what it is predicting, it is predicting the probability. If you add everything, it sums up to one. And what we are gaining, we are gaining only the, the arg max. We call it arg max, but essentially it is saying that the, take the maximum value, ignore all the others, take the maximum value and do that. There are other several techniques also. This is a very simplified view, but to answer your questions, yes, deep learning also uses that. Thanks. Any other question? Yeah, uh, another question. You mentioned the naive base. Are we gonna yeah. talk about it later on or? Yeah, we'll, we'll be dealing. I can give you a flavor of that. Naive base. Uh, no, let's spark it. I think it will be because I have to deal with at least one or two algorithms in machine learning before we can talk about naive Bayes, right? Okay. All it considers is a small uh, assumption, right? Which it takes on Bayes theorem and it, it becomes naive Bayes. Naive is what? Simple, um, uncomplicated, very simple guy, right? We call it, he's a naive person, right? Um, so he, he they, they took an assumption over here that all the events are mutually independent. That's the naiveness which they take. So here we are predicting A given B, right? And in case of machine learning, or let's say in a large language model, what is happening? If you, if you think about it, what is happening is I'm predicting next token or next word given all these words. This is what I'm predicting, right? This is what is the output of this. Given all these words in my context, in my prompt, what is my next word? And the probability of that I'm predicting, right? 
when we are doing this, naive bit says that this P, let's say A, given X1, X2, X3, X4, and so on and so forth, Xn, these events in itself are independent with each other. Okay, so X1 is not dependent on X2, X2 is not, they are mutually independent, right? When they are independent, what we can do is we can simplify this equation like this. Because x1, x2 are in, independent, from here, which is very complicated, we can arrive quickly at this point. And that's the naiveness, which, which is not entirely true, but it's a reasonable assumption which they are making. And which will be used in a spam filters in many in many machine learning algorithms we are using naive bit and it is working very good right it works with a very good uh, predictive power accuracy and all those things and this is the naiveness which we are assuming that's why it is called naive base but apart from that everything remains the same as base theorem okay okay thanks okay even if it didn't make sense don't worry about it we'll go over it one more time okay 